Welcome to Poetic Lines, where writers make the language sing. Normally we focus on one writer per episode and that person's experience of poetry and the creative process. But today, in honor of National Poetry Month, we want to share several views of what poetry can mean to people and how it enriches life's journey. To do this, we've gone into the archives and pulled together several of the most memorable clips from the past six years. What we noticed as we compiled these clips is the range of emotions poetry can convey and its ability to provide some sort of comfort despite conflict and lack of clarity. Poetry can be a mirror or an anchor for people. It can provide strokes of beauty and music that touches to the core. It can also force us to confront the ugliness in life. For many readers, it is like secular prayer and it reminds us of what it means to be human. As one writer so beautifully told me, poetry shows us what is perishable, what endures, and what makes us who we are. Enjoy. Night walking. A half moon, barely enough to light my way in this darkness. Head craned upward, searching for constellations, drawn to black space. I almost stumble over a snapping turtle who does not notice. Eyes full of moonbeams, intent upon shifting ground, her eggs glistening. Forgotten orbs brooding under the night sky, she lumbers back to the swamp leaving me to ponder the blossoming of each hidden moon. Um, someone said a long time ago that the function of a poet is to be a witness, and I think that's true, that um, what I try to do is witness the smallest details in nature and sort of correlate them to things that are that I'm thinking about in my everyday life maybe some problem that I'm thinking about and when you go outside I walk dogs a lot um, I'm always noticing different things about nature and about the environment depending on how I'm feeling inside so I think you pick up on different things but that act of witnessing is truly the poet's job, I think. And, and sort of witnessing and creating a verbal photograph and a spark for someone else to take in. Because so many people right now don't take the time to notice little things, um, we're all so caught up in trying to uh, stay in the same place, but we're going three times as fast with the economy and with um, it seems like it's not good enough that your child is in one activity, they have to be in five activities, and everything seems so quick, and everyone's living so quickly. And with all of the email and the cell phones, and everything's just at the speed of light. So if I can try to slow down and try to find something and record it on a piece of paper, and someone else takes the time, hopefully, to read that piece of paper, they may actually see that and be encouraged to go look for themselves and witness some things of their own, of the natural world. I walked into the marsh in search of you. Instead, I found 11 swans, the question of their necks, punctuated by black eyes and bright beaks. Serene on the murky lake, the feathers of their wings lifted like sails. I heard the narrow trunks of pines asking directions from the wind, warnings of birdsong as a kestrel flew low over the water, then disappeared. A young blue heron stood, poised among the tall reeds, resting on one foot, then the other. No one noticed my presence, and I did not find you, only these creatures that speak in spite of me. The lines that make you are infinite, 
but I count them every day to hear the stories you carry. These are not secrets, but records, things we should know but ignore. If I commit the sin of tearing you from the tree, I find another world inside the torn vein, another lifetime of counting the records of who walked here before, of what lovers lay here holding each other through wars and starvation. Some days I stand here until I lose focus and travel, drifting off out of the moment, too full of it. And my legs are now like trees, mindless but vigilant, held into the earth by the rules of debt, what we owe to nature for trying to tear ourselves away. I drift and the pleasure of touch comes again, layers of green in the mountainside, a tickling in my palms. The pleasure is that of being lost here in the crowd of trunks and pulp, the ground thick with the death of you, sinking under my feet as I go, touching one and another, linking myself through until the place where I entered is gone. When I am afraid, my breath is caught in my throat. When I am not afraid, I lift both hands up under a bunch of you to find the way the world felt on the first day. I remember writing a poem um, when my, my first child died, uh, my, my son, and um, that poem I've since lost. But the process of um, getting my, um, my grief out onto paper um, is part is actually the the central engine of what poetry is to me in, in my life. It has um, kept me alive, um, literally kept me alive. It's kept me alive emotionally. When I was working in the factories, it was a way of um, maintaining and protecting um, a degree of um, humanity. Mm -hmm. You know, it was not easy protecting my creativity in that environment because it's so. Uh, so regimented and so harsh, but um, poetry has been my lifeline to myself and outside myself to the world around me. Well, I, I've come back from some um, rather devastating um, challenges in life, and the first one was the loss of the child, and the marriage fell apart shortly after that, and, and um, I suffered a period of um, nervous exhaustion and severe depression. And, the people who were closest to me were really concerned about whether or not I would, you know, be able to live. And I came back from that, and, and, and coming back from that was a matter of um, having some faith in my ability to, to do something with poetry. Um, but um, people closest to me also know that they've seen me in my darkest hours when my very survival was a question. And um, they know that I have come from some very difficult places. Mm -hmm. And this poem managed to bring home a pushcart prize, which I was very happy to receive. Um, American Income. The survey says all groups can make more money if they lose weight, except black men. Men of other colors and women of all colors have more gold, but black men are the summary of weight, a lead-thick thing on the scales, meters spinning until they ring off the end of the numbering of accumulation, how things grow heavy, fish on the ends of lines that become whales, then prehistoric sea life beyond all memories. The billion days of human hands working, doing all the labor one can imagine. Hands now the population of cactus leaves on a papyrus moon waiting for the fire. The notes from all their singing gone up into the salt breath of tears of children that dry, rise up to be the crystalline canopy of promises. The infinite gone fishing days with the apologies for not being able to love anymore, gone down inside earth, somewhere where women make no demands have fewer dreams of forever, these feet that marched and ran and got cut off, 
these hearts torn out of chests by nameless thieves, this thrashing until the chaff has gone out and black men know the gold of being the dead center of things, where pain is the gateway to Jerusalem's body trees, places for meditation and howling, keeping the weeping heads of gods in their eyes. Refugee. A man carries his door, the door of his house, because when the war is over, he is going home, where he will hang it on its hinges and lock it tight while he tries to remember the word for welcome. If his house is gone when he returns, he will raise it from rubble around this door. If he cannot return, the door will remember the rest of the house so he can build it again elsewhere. And if he cannot go on, his door can be a pallet for his rest, a stretcher to carry him, his shade from sun, his shield. That term, starkly beautiful, because the beautiful is seldom pretty. Uh, it's, for me, it's closer to, the beautiful is closer to uh, a clear apprehension of, of things an understanding of them that, uh, than it is to something pretty. Mm -hmm. I think that we, we get a moment of uh, rest, a moment of serenity, a moment of understanding, a moment when the chaos recedes for a little bit, perhaps because we're reading a poem that makes things gel for us or somehow uh, you know, uh, uh, helps us make some integrated sense between our hearts in our heads and and then you know we're back in our lives and things get pretty rough and tumble and then uh, then we find that again and we find it again and over a long period of time you be there's this sort of deep reassurance that comes from being able to go to poetry for that um, and I don't think it's it you know I don't think individual poems um, change people's lives. I mean, there's all this talk about the power of the word, and you know, that's wonderful. I think it is, but I think it's incremental over a long period of time. So people have to read a lot of poetry. They have to find the poets that sustain them. They have to find the poets that uh, speak to them. Um, and, you know, and that's a, that's a kind of commitment. Because I lay on my back as a boy in the grass of the small yard behind our house, watching clouds move and become faces, mostly. I was able to sit for a long time holding my dying mother's hand as her sleeping face changed like a field in the sun under moving clouds. And to hold my newborn grandson now and watch his features changing moment to moment propelled by some inner wind, I suppose, must be like dreaming. And because this watching is above, after, and before words, I am unable to describe what I believe I understand and how it comforts and sustains me. Daughter, think of a gray stone mirror as far away as light travels in the time it takes me to say natural satellite. But like a bulb that reliably brightens each time we open the door tonight, it is true that the moon follows us. Walking home some evenings, we trip headlong on our own shadows and see the slightest sliver of her white guidance. Others, we come quickly around a corner and the night is suddenly less heavy. There's a physics to her place in your window as we move at the speeds that bodies can bear. But I see in the starry shine of your eyes in my rear view that I have not answered your question. Soon we will contemplate the darkness together, wonder about what comes to fill the sky, and neither of us will need an answer. That idea of have I gotten it right, of course, is appeals to my analytical side. You know, I mm -hmm. make my living as an engineer, and, and there are times when it is possible to be right and wrong. Uh, not as many as I think most people think who mm -hmm. don't practice the, the, the discipline, but uh, the desire to be right certainly is part of why I write. 
and poetry is taught so poorly in so many places. I, I don't think they, that people think of poetry as a way of exploring. They, they think of it as something to be memorized and written about and footnoted. And when I've invited some of my friends from work to come hear me read or come with me to someone else's reading, almost always the first thing they say to me is, wow, that was fun. As if there was no fun to be had there and I was showing them the fun that they didn't know about. When the poets find out I'm an engineer, it's, it's a little less of a surprise. Partially that's because um, many of the poets that I reach out to, I, I sort of disclose my whole background when I'm recruiting them for my series or I want them to know what they're getting into. Uh, so I think I, I, I dampen the surprise that way. But there are many, many people who have the, the technical discipline of some kind that, that become great poets. And I always go back to William Carlos Williams, who was a physician and, and, a, and, and a poet. And once I make that connection for people, I think it's less, less of an issue for them. The poets are more open to the idea than the engineers, I have to say. Pinwheel. Take the brunt of the wind on full and the wheel turns fastest. The louder the pressure on your ears, the faster the shiny butterflies will turn, the more the reflected silverfish of sunlight will run the length of your smiling body. So it is with so many things. The harder the force against you, the brighter the light from turning that force around the more places that light will fall. To my father, a woods is not a woods without a wood pile in it, a brush mess near it where the lesser limbs landed. To my father, season is a verb, a reason not to disturb one chord or another. I swear his veins run bar chain oil, to my father, no carpet is as royal as a sawdust trail in the muddy soil. All that smacks of riches is as air to him compared to the ring of his axe in the hills and the ditches around his shacks and those stacks banked up against a future winter's weather. And before we're awake, he's back at that brick altar opening the cold and stubborn iron heart of the house, turning the fact of newsprint and tinder into a kind of prayer for our warming, his first tender act of the morning. What stands out is the do-it-yourself nature of my childhood. My parents were back to the nature types. They weren't hippies exactly. But they had kind of a, you know, hippie sensibility. They wanted to make their own soap, and they wanted to bake their own bread, and they wanted to build their own stuff, and they wanted to, you know, plow their own driveway. And uh, that sensibility is, I think, a legacy that they left to me. And so I think early on, as a kid, I learned the the care and attention that goes into any craft, any handmade thing, and the joy that can uh, come from something that you've made yourself. And so I've always um, been drawn to things that I can make, and poetry turned out to be one of those things that I can make and that I get that kind of joy from. So I think they modeled how to make a good thing to me, and it's still with me. Yeah, I, I guess I have a very optimistic view of heartbreak. Mm. You know, whenever I've experienced it for myself and I've had my share, uh, I, I, I'm amazed at how things work out, not ever in the way that you think they will, um, but they do work out and that uh, sort of alchemy of life is really interesting to me. And poetry was always kind of my first love, you know, my, uh, I, I hadn't really realized it, but you know, my mom read us a lot of poetry on the farm. You know, cold winter nights we'd be complaining about something or, you know, hot summer days we'd be in from the fields and thinking that our lives on the farm were, you know, crap and we hated it. And she'd bring out some poem that would sort of answer to whatever it was that we were complaining about. And uh, they, you know, they weren't 
hard-hitting moral lessons. They were just um, strokes of beauty, moments of insight that would kind of turn us inward instead of, you know, being angry about our situations. The wallpaper says hello. The wallpaper misses you something awful. The wallpaper can't stop wondering when you were thinking of coming home. The clocks moved on. The sinks, 10 million tears are dry. Our floors have gotten over you, or so they claim and claim. The windows clearly feel the same, but call me, call me soon, my love, and tell me what to say. Next time, the fading and tedious wallpaper whispers your beautiful household name. Capture the flag. I don't remember the game ever ending. Just the gray morning, the day camp met in the barn, chose up teams, and we became scouts, spies, generals, foot soldiers. Don't remember either side keeping that rag of red calico, just leisurely hours of shouts, hand signals, dashes across tarry beach roads, and the odd safety I felt, being alone for a few minutes, not shy for a change, or scared as a newcomer, just crouched on damp pine needles at my hidden post, breathing hard, listening. Mm. And the second flag poem is an event of more recent uh, American experience, Katrina. This is called The Roofs. They are painted with SOS. Please help us. No food, no water. Their shingles glint in the sun. Some have the stars and stripes tied to chimneys or laid out flat like a beach towel. People stand by the flags, waving their arms. Many roofs have gaping holes where families have hacked their way from attics with water up to their waists. Now each family waits, hunched together, holding shirts over the old people. These roofs cover houses that had to disappear before anyone saw them. When the water goes, we can forget them again. Our mother was choosing tomatoes, I think she told it, in the produce section of the old star market when her skirt fell off. I suppose it was a wraparound that had come untied, and luckily she wore a slip like most women her age. Or it might have been cherries. She loved those, though they disappeared too quickly when we were all still at home. But this is years later, and of course she's mortified, drops her handful onto its heap, stoops down quick before anyone she knows comes by which was a challenge in the old star market since she knew nearly everyone. I say old because a mega market has just opened in its place. Escalator, food courts, acres of produce. They cut the ribbon there last week and now we're emailing back and forth remembering mom's visits to star where every roll of her cart brought her someone to chat with. Imagining her returns full of encounters. I haven't seen her since Latin school. Diagnoses. I hardly recognized him. Puzzles, wedding talks, jokes to our father in the so quiet house. There she leans over the produce counter. But here our accounts differ. One brother has it, a courtly gentleman tapped her shoulder to tell her, excuse me, madam, as she felt the fabric slide weirdly onto her ankles, which makes a better story, I suppose, so we'll go with it. Our mother loved stories. Thanks for watching this special episode of Poetic Lines. Hosting this show is a pleasure, especially during April when Spring and National Poetry Month bring out the poet in all of us.
sits there all hunched over, those weird glasses on his face. Impossibly strong lenses to interrogate small space. In place and gears with tweezers and winding tiny springs. The enabler of time itself, creator of small things. But in an age of Chinese knockoffs, five bucks out on the street, digital, disposable, some point, admit defeat. Soon he will not be of value, his lease will be withdrawn. The store will be a Starbucks, the watchmaker will be gone. The set right there, says Ernie, as it shudders to the ground. The second floor store made sense before they weighed 400 pounds. Philo Farnsworth's troubled children, he used to fix them all. When you still could change a picture tube and then degauss a coil. But now the world wants plasma, 42 inch LCDs. When they break, no way to fix them. You just buy a bigger screen, like American supremacy we always thought would last. The small TV repair shop will soon be in the past. Watchman and repairman is the marriage counselor next. Perhaps it's this New England soil where waste is next to sin. But I can't bear to throw away what's barely broken in. So I'll fill my house with picture tubes, not wind my watch too tight, and keep loving the same woman until I get it right. 